With horror stories about dogs in shelters at the forefront of animal welfare discussions, people were demanding that animals deserve better. And today's guest was the perfect man for the job. Whether creating a program for marathon runners to train with pound pups or bringing pit bulls to afternoon tea, he used science and data to change the dog catcher narrative. Hello, I'm James Jacobson. Welcome to The Long Leash. We reached back into our archive to bring you the story of a dog catcher who revolutionized the way that dog shelters approach their problems. Ed Jamison started out as an animal welfare warden in Ohio, otherwise known as a dog catcher, and he worked his way all the way up to the big city of Dallas and finally now has become the director of Operation Kindness, a nonprofit no-kill shelter located in North Texas. It is committed to giving every animal the care and kindness that they deserve. Stick around after the interview for an update on what Ed has been up to recently. We're excited to share with you the ways that Ed has reinvented an important municipal service, the role of dog catcher, and how he's helping to reframe animal welfare in cities across America. Ed Jamison, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for having me. So as I've prepped for our conversation, one thought keeps coming back and back and over in my head, which is that you started out as a dog catcher and you changed the perception of animal control. It reminds me of the Margaret Mead quote about, you know, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can can change the world. And you have been doing that in the role of from initially a dog catcher. Is that right? Did you start out in animal control? Uh, yeah. And that's what the, you know, the industry, you know, many years ago wanted to be thought as, as the, as the dog catcher. Um, and the industry itself has been working really hard that even, you know, true animal control agencies are doing way more than just catching dogs at this point. This industry has made a mistake at not looking at the human side of all of this. So even just saying the dog, the animal, there's humans behind all of these too, which is something that I'm sure we're going to talk about that, makes this job that much more exciting. Well, let's set the stage. In the early 2000s, you were in Cleveland, Ohio, or a suburb of Cleveland, right? Where you got yep. your for Garfield Heights? Garfield Heights, yep. And was this your first job or like out of school? Was this, how did you get into this? So I was, I was a young father. I was in landscaping before. And then I said, hey, you know what? I need to go get a job with the city for the insurance and the stability and and all of that. So I, I was young into the workforce, but it wasn't my first job, but was certainly, yeah, this is where I thought I would be the rest of my rest of my life, get in the government world with retirement. And- well, speaking of government world, I mean, your title is Animal Warden. Mm-hmm. Probably not a term you think fondly of today, but what was Animal Warden? And, and, it and- really was. It was trying to, you know, the thought was just, just handle animal problems. Yeah. And whether that was wildlife, whether it was cats, dogs, whatever, a bat in the attic, whatever, it was just handle animal problems. I was lucky that the mayor, when I when I became the warden there, understood that I'm helping people with their problems as well. And so that really kind of ignited the fact that it's a lot more than just catching an animal. You want to fix problems. So as an example, there was wildlife was a part of it. And so be setting a bunch of traps, be it for raccoons or skunks or whatever. And I'm always like, they're living under this porch or in this chimney. Will you let me work with the people to fix the problem? Because if you don't plug the chimney, just a new family of raccoons is going to eventually move in there. And that really kind of, for me at least, showed that there, there's a lot better way to do this than just how we've done it for a bunch of decades before. So you were sort of thinking outside the box, but when you came up with this revolutionary, you know, mindset in terms of, say, the raccoons, how was that received? Um, the first thing any government's going to say is, is it going to cost me money or is it going to save us money? And Garfield Heights is not a rich city at all. And so I had to show them that I can do this stuff. And by working with the residents, it will, in the long term, will certainly save money because we won't keep coming back to the same house over and over and over again but we might have to help with a little upfront costs so that we don't have the continuing costs. So that took a little bit um, just from the, the government side that, hey, budgets are budgets, period. How did that conversation go with your boss at the time? 
Uh, it, it was just, they're like, can't you just do it like we've done it before? <laughs> Every day it seems like you're coming in with some new idea or some new new way to do it. And I'm like, well, we're trying, trying to get better. And I was lucky they, they let me think, but it always came down to dollars and cents. Is mm-hmm. it going to cost overtime? Are you going to have to buy supplies? Are you going to have to buy whatever? Um, and if I'm like, I'm going to find a way to get it done, will you just say it's okay for me to do it? The residents, it took a little bit different. People get used to what they're used to. Just call mm-hmm. the warden. They'll just come catch the animal, and then that's it, and then we'll call them again when we need them again. Many people were receptive once you could explain what the long-term fix was going to be. Mm-hmm. In the short term, people were like, I don't want to play my part in it, or I don't want to go buy a cap for the chimney, even if I was going to help them put it on. So it definitely took some explaining as to what the long-term solution was going to be. And say, hey, as much as you like me or I like you, we don't need to see each other every other week over getting raccoons out of your chimney. Okay, so you moved from that very small suburb, Garfield Heights, to the city of Cleveland. And when you went over to be an animal control officer, which sounds similar vein to animal warden, what were you bringing to the job? Yeah, really just it was a a much bigger scale. At Cleveland, I was the chief animal control officer, which ran the entire operation. So all the field activities as well as the sheltering. So in Garfield Heights, the volume was just so much lower and you catch our, you know, whatever, a handful of dogs a week and then you work hard to find their owner and if not try to find them a home and was successful. But the city of Cleveland shelter is the largest city run shelter in the state of Ohio. So it was definitely on a much bigger scale and a lot of people that they're now my colleagues, but they're like, oh, we always liked you, Ed, but we were worried, could you handle how big this is? And everything is just about processes, putting together good programs. I'm huge on data. I never claim to be the smartest guy in the world, but I can read a chart. So if you can record it and give me the numbers, I can then figure out, is this something that's working or not working? But um, that was really the, the first glimpse into the real that you've got to have some good process in here. Cause I was, I don't know, 4,000, 4,500 dogs um, a year in a, one of the most notoriously bad physical shelters in the country. It was a big dungeon and mostly blockheaded pit bull type dogs is, is what you had. And we got creative and that's when we created city dogs. And, you know, I'm, I'm big on, you can cry about what you have or you can make a plan for what you have. And so we really flipped the script to change that perception of pit bulls by creating a program that was like, we got awesome pit bulls here. Come on down and adopt one. Well, let's talk about city dogs. So this was the, I guess, a trademarked system that you created. What is it? Oh, it's amazing. It's some, some of the things I have, uh, you know, all over my office, really proud of that time that when you're going into a place that's got a notorious history, even though there's good people and all that, a lot of things stacked against you, you got to give them something to associate good with it. Mm-hmm. And I spent the first couple of weeks in Cleveland thinking, how am I going to show people I have other than pit bulls for them to adopt? And after a couple of weeks, I was like, that's what I have. I get all the <laughs> non-bullies out really easy. I don't have to use a lot of resources to get them out. And then I have a kennel full of really good blockheads. Mm-hmm. And so um, a woman named Timmy Sullivan, she used to be on the Best Friends board, but she lives in Northeast Ohio. Just one who never judged, was always good for me to sit down and kind of just spit out all kinds of ideas, sat down with me. And then we're like, why don't we flip it and embrace how many we have as opposed to acting like, you know, we have an occasional chihuahua or an occasional lab. (laughs) What we're going to have most of is going to be a bunch of blockheads and let's embrace it. And it is amazing from my seat here in in Texas now to look back at what they're doing in Ohio and how city dogs is the cool place to be. And if you want a cool dog, go adopt from them. And so I'm I'm really, really proud of that team and how they embrace that. So was it basically a rebranding exercise? Mm -hmm. Yep. I did change the name of the department. We were Cleveland Animal Control, I changed the name to Animal Care and Control Mm -hmm. to associate that. Yes, there is some control here, but we also are, you know, there's animal care involved in this, which included, we had the old Cleveland Police logo was our logo. I changed that into a little more welcoming at the Cleveland skyline and some bright colors that just to make yourself a little more approachable and show that this isn't just enforcement here, that we're actually a resource to help you. And then the City Dogs, you know, is a program out of the shelter and the animals in there. And they, they coincided very well. The logos the shared similarities, shared the Cleveland skyline. And so that people could play off of that and know that, Hey, this is a program of Cleveland animal care and control. So how did you change the perception? What were the methods that you used to change the perception of pit bulls? Cause you had a lot, what percentage of the dogs that were in the shelter were pity? Well, what's funny is that at any given time, the percentage in a shelter, and this is probably true almost anywhere in the country, the percentage at a given time is going to be way higher than what actually comes in. 
It's because many of the non-bullies, they move quick. The second they're off of their legal hold, whether you have pre-adoptions or fast-track adoptions or transfer to rescues, they get gobbled up really, really fast. So what you're left with are the bigger, higher energy. So just taking a snapshot isn't necessarily... We ran an exercise in Dallas, and I'd asked the team and some employees who'd been there a long time, and of course, oh, 85%, 90% of what comes in here has to be and the number was somewhere in the low 20 percent is what actually got intake. Mm-hmm. But at any given time, you could find 80 percent. But that's what's in there because the others get adopted so yeah. quickly. So what were the things that you did to say that, hey, you know, to increase the demand for pit bulls? Yeah, well, a lot of it took me having to have a change of thought. I have evolved over the almost last 20 years of me being in this industry that, hey, this might be how it was done today or yesterday. It doesn't mean how it has to be. There's a lot of things I do now that I reluctantly let somebody talk me into giving a shot. Sure, let's try it. You know, but if I was a betting man, which I'm not, I'm going to bet this isn't going to work. And lo and behold, it works. And so it's having an open mind for one, being willing to try stuff, but knowing there, there's danger when they're dealing with people or animals, there's dangers that come with it. So you never want anybody's face to get bitten off in the process of trying something out. But a good example was that shelter was so bad in Cleveland. It, double stacked, it was just a noise box, 150 animals just, just barking and looking across from each other it was a noise box. So the volunteers were really trying to, um, with the walking program, worked really, really hard. But the animals were so amped when you took them out of their cage, it wasn't an enjoyable experience for the volunteer or the dog. Because the dog's pulling, you know, he's happy as heck just to be out of that dungeon. Dogs were breaking loose of people and everything. So think of dogs playing for life. I did not want them to come. And it, I've seen these videos of multiple five, six, eight, mostly blockhead dogs running around in play yards together. I'm like, this can't work. There's no way. You're just going to have dog fight after dog fight. And they came to the Cleveland area. I sent somebody. I didn't give them much credit, though. And they came back to like, yeah, this is pretty cool. And I was like, there's no way. And then the county shelter, which would pull animals from my shelter, would transfer them in, started running play groups with the dogs they pulled from my kennel. So I was like, well, crap, I can't use that as an excuse that it can't be done because they're taking the same dogs. It's just, yeah, they've got a different play yard. So then I I brought the group back again, went into it with a totally different mentality of let's see how we would make this work at the Cleveland Kennel. And then that was, it gave those dogs that exercise that they needed. It allowed them to get that energy out, to act like the dogs. There's all kinds of marketing opportunities. People love seeing six, eight, 10 animals running around, playing together, jumping in and out of swimming pools and all of that. And so there were all of these other add-on benefits on top of, I just want to get the dogs outside so they didn't have to spend their entire life with us inside this, you know, horrible building. And so lots of things like that to let the dog be a dog um, is huge. You don't necessarily have to like big dogs. That's fine. Everybody likes what they like. But bullies have such great personalities that when you allow them to express that, so we started jogging programs. At the time, I used to be a marathon runner. I don't have time to run marathons anymore, but started a program with volunteers of taking the dogs out. And we'd run the streets of downtown Cleveland, 10, 15, 20 of us jogging these dogs. Again, great exercise. The dogs come back to their cage, tired. They go to sleep. They're great, but people would see us. We'd have adopt me vests on them, and we all had city dogs, runners, apparel. So people knew when the city dogs were in town. Um, running past Jacobs Field or the LeBron James, you know, mural on the uh, the buildings, dog-friendly bars. We took dogs. So you took dogs to bars? Yeah. Yep. Um, You know, especially ones with um, outdoor patios and whatnot, they were Uh, dog-friendly. And we put an Adopt Me vest on them. And you had to be smart about it, though. And everybody wanted the dog who was there the longest. He might be the the most high strung that might not be the best candidate the chance of something bad going so it was you know, some inebriated people and, and, an, and an angry dog maybe the best yeah <laughs> not not always the best mix and so you know we, we got to be smart about this because these dogs they can sell themselves better than we can sell them and so just anywhere that would allow dogs we made sure that the city dogs were invited and would go to any type of event and turn into a city dogs event now, earlier you said that you love data and charts and give me some data. So let's talk about some of the data numbers in terms of the most poignant number is, is shelter euthanasia. When you first came into Cleveland, do you, do you have a sense of what the euthanasia rates were and what they dropped to? They, they were in the low to mid 70 percentile. Wow. And, and that was that was live release rate. So that's the inverse would be euthanasia rate. OK, so 30 percent would be euthanized. Correct. And then when you left? When I left, we were they were right at 90. 
just 89%, I think, my the, the year that I left. So a drop from 30% euthanasia to, to 10%. Correct. And that is a trend that has been happening across the country. And the New York Times did a really nice story a few years back and, and profiled your efforts in Dallas, which is where you went to after Cleveland, to talk about how you really had changed that shelter. Yes. When people demanded that animals deserve better, in, particularly in government shelters, you know, there's open records, there's there's no hiding data. And so it makes it where you have to embrace that stuff. You have to embrace being transparent. You have to be embraced. And to me, I've had a lot of success on energizing the community. Look, I'm not hiding anything. I'm going to tell you there's days we have about 10 bad choices to make, and we're trying to make the least bad of those 10 bad choices. But with your help, maybe we won't have to make any bad choices today. Numbers are numbers. And the number of cages that you have is the number of you know cages that you have when you're an open admission shelter. And trying to lie about it or, or candy coat it isn't going to get people energized. So I was very, very open in Cleveland. It was difficult, you know, but I was like, look, we're bringing 11 dogs and we only have four open cages. Let's just do some math here. There's, you know, so something that we have to get more outcomes. We can always slow down what comes in. We're animal control. We have to bring in whatever we have to bring in. And so that then allows you to start to set goals and measurements as to what will success look like. And I have always, since I started leading teams, said, let's just try to win today. If we win more days than we lose, then we're going to start making traction and making headway. And it's pretty cool hearing some of my team and my former teams talk about, we break it down to, to win the morning or win the afternoon or to win the hour or the, and if you just go with the, with the you're just not going to always win. And that is difficult. It doesn't mean you're a failure. Sometimes things don't work out, but when you start winning, it becomes contagious and you find a way to win. And that, that I think a lot of government shelters just start taking that. We have to do things because we don't have a choice. Our budget is what it is. Usually don't have really nice buildings, but we also don't want a bunch of animals to die. Most, there's not many people in this industry anymore that are in it because they like things to die. That, that's just not the motivation to be in an animal services uh, organization anymore. So it's pretty cool when you look back, even the last five years of the transformation of government shelters across this country. And so much of that is connected with the way you were able to motivate your team through the transparency of the numbers. Up until that point, were they talking about that in Cleveland or was that sort of a hushed thing? No, it was it was more hushed. I'm not sure if you mean within the staff or just as the city as a whole, but they weren't big on putting out numbers. Right. Um, I remember I really had to talk them into it and there was a grant that required you had numbers posted is how I finally got that. I said, well, we're doing good. We'll get money if we do. Yeah. Right. And that's what it it was like $500 too. It wasn't even like it was (laughs) $50,000. It was $500. But to apply for this grant, it would give you $500 and you couldn't even apply for it. And that that's what it took. And then they saw, wow, we actually got more people on board because people don't know they'll figure out or make up their own numbers. Mm -hmm. And that's when you put actual facts out there that no, this isn't just a kill factory. And yes, we don't succeed all the time, but look at how much better we're doing over time. And we're getting there. I've always had success on getting people on board who are like, yep, I want to take it from 86% to 90% or now we're at 90. What are we going to do to try to get to 91 or 92? And let's let's pause right here. We're going to take a short break and we will be right back. And now a message from your dog. Every day with you is like a day at the beach and I want as many beach days as possible. I want to run and sniff and find a good stick to carry. I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want Everpup. It infuses any food you give me with health and life and vibrancy. I can feel it. It's a strange thing to do, sprinkle this powder on my food, but I wouldn't have it any other way. My time with you is precious and irreplaceable, and I'm thrilled to be with you for as long as possible. Here's to puppy playtime and senior snoozes. <laughs> no matter how old I get, I want my ever pup. It just makes me feel good in this life and the next and the next and the next. I am so grateful to be your dog and for the ever pup you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. 
But to get the best price possible, join the EverPup Club at everpupclub.com, where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Everpup, every day. You're listening to The Long Leash. We're speaking with Ed Jamison. So we're seeing a general decrease in shelter euthanasia, not just in the facilities that you've been in, but across the United States. How come? Again, I think that the awareness is huge. Um, I'm fortunate enough, I'm on I'm on a few animal welfare, um, animal related boards, but one I'm really, really proud of is being on that when that group started and I wasn't a part of it then, but nobody was really counting. Everybody was just saying what they think is going on out there. And then once you actually have tangible numbers as to how many animals are coming into shelters and how many are coming out, you can start to develop plans. So that's a nonprofit organization, shelteranimalscount.org, and that's what they do is they count. Yep, and it is is nonjudgmental. They're Switzerland. They're not saying if you're a good shelter, bad shelter. Don't even calculate what your live release rate is. You you can do whatever you want with that. It's simply putting out, um, it's a self-reporting group, and it simply puts all those numbers together. And so you can talk about trends. You can pull stuff by region and area, different parts of the country to say what's happening in this part of the country. But it gives you facts. It's helped me in municipal world to be able to talk to the higher ups. Hey, I'm not making this up. This is the trend that's happening nationally, which is why we want to do whatever new program, you know, we want to try to get get implemented. So there's the transparency, you know, thanks to shelter animals count and more and more shelters. Do you know have a sense of how many shelters contribute? What percentage of shelters across the country? Yes, and we're actually going through some planning. I think that we have, it's an estimated number. There's some 4,000 shelters, and I want to say I just saw it. I think that we have, we believe, 40%. I know our goal is to get up over 50 is one of our shorter-term goals. Is to, and this is all self-reporting, mm-hmm. that, look, people are voluntarily reporting this information to us on a monthly monthly data. But it's enough that you're able to make assumptions, you know, drawn across the, across the board. It's not like five shelters. It's... 1600 or 1800 or something or is what putting it is what's putting into it now. So the transparency helps the marketing of, you know, pro pit bulls helps. What are some other factors that you can point to why we're seeing a decrease in shelter euthanasia? Well, resources, there's a reality of it takes money. It takes effort to save animals. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of sickness out in every community, whether you're in the North, South, East or West, or, you know, different things that uh, animals can have. And it took me a while in Cleveland that say even through all the best efforts, if I can't have the veterinary component of it, some of it you're just, you know, it, you're running uphill because if the animals just get too sick, it can get either they, they just aren't going to be able to live or you don't have the, the money to to patch them up. So luckily in Dallas, the resources were a little bit different. It was became a standalone department. So I had a lot more say over the budget. Here's your money. Do, do, do whatever you're going to do with it. And I started with medical was the big part of making sure we get these things healthy, that they get their vaccines timely coming in. So you're not creating any new sickness once they're here. Um, And so I think that a lot of awareness and things like that on the medical front, there are veterinary shortages, which is a whole other topic that the industry is going to be facing. But I do think that people, once they realized there were resources to get vaccines, some very basic veterinary care that that that's one of the first components for any shelter being able to save more lives. So let's talk about Dallas. When you went to Dallas, it was one of the more notorious shelters in the United States. Yeah. There were some really horrific stories. You can you recount some? <laughs> uh, there's all kinds of stuff that when you would Google, it's funny there, there's a lot more good stories now when you okay. Google than, than there was when in 2017, when I was trying to do some research on it, but just as many governments didn't do, there wasn't enough effort and attention paid to us. You can give them enough that residents aren't calling and whatever, but people were literally dying in the streets by loose dogs in Dallas. You mean their humans were being killed by loose dogs? Correct. Okay. Correct. So you had this field aspect of animal control mm-hmm. not being handled. Meanwhile, there was this demand to do better for the animals that do come in the shelter and to rapidly increase the live release rate. So I'm the dummy who raised my hand when they said, we want you to increase the pickup of loose animals in the field, and we want you to increase shelter live release rate at the same time. They they usually go opposite. (laughs) All right, you slow down intake, and then your live release rate goes up. 
and I, I need to be resourced properly. And I saw that they were taking it serious. So I was one of the um, either really smart or not really smart people that threw my name in the hat for for that job. And I, I am really, really glad. I think it would have been the four year anniversary just came a couple of days ago on the 17th of when I started in at DAS. And I'm really, really proud of the work that that team and that community did. We'll talk about some of the work that you and your team did in Dallas before you moved to your current position. We'll, we'll talk about that. Boy, it was tough. Like I said, we had, so they did a study, the Boston consulting firm did an actual study of all. So it's just, if you can imagine an audit on steroids, that it's just like, we're going to measure things that nobody even thought to measure. So, so a data geek like you really enjoyed that. Correct. It it gave me a roadmap to say, this is the worst thing. This is the next worst thing. This is broken. This is kind of okay. I can live with this number for a while. They measured field response time, the number of animals picked up, how many calls an officer would go on in the course of a day, compared them to other like cities, which was really nice to say, look, I've got 40% less officers or kennel tax or veterinarians. Don't expect me to get the same outcome if I don't have the same amount of resources. Because this is fascinating. So I'm presuming some benefactor gave money to hire Boston Consulting, which is a pretty fancy, Correct. expensive consulting yep, firm. Non-governmental money, yes. Just to look at this problem so that you had the data. so that They you literally could... hired, you know how they do traffic studies and you see the person sitting on the street, you know, clicking as cars are coming by? <laughs> yeah. They did that with dogs. They counted how many loose dogs they would see in given areas at given times. And then at least you've got some tangible numbers to at least acknowledge the problem and then start developing a plan. And then you have something measurable that what will success look like? Um, we all know what success can feel like, but feeling isn't always, you know, feeling could be your perception. Ah, I felt like it was a nice day outside, but I was inside all day. Unless you were really out there, you don't really know. So I really like the effort. There was a pretty visionary donor or or like, how did that study even get commissioned? How did someone come up with that? That's a great idea. Yeah, there's some really, really good foundations in Dallas and the, the whole DFW Metroplex. Of course, they care about animals, but there was this human component as well on mm-hmm. this story mm-hmm. that, man, you know, we love animals. We want more animals to get out of the shelter alive. We also want people to be alive after they go get their mail and not not get mauled. And what's interesting is that with some of the data that we collected once I was there and really started paying, I was anticipating. I'm from Ohio. It's about as opposite from Texas as they get. <laughs> um, you know, there's no Lake Erie to look forward to. And, you know, Lake Effect <laughs> snow coming, it just doesn't happen. But I was envisioning tumbleweeds, the ghost town with just dogs, you know, coming out of the saloon, <laughs> kicking the door open. That's not Dallas. No, it was actually, you know, it, it's an urban setting. Yeah. There was people all over the place. There were dogs all over the place too. And then or loose dogs. But then my, my data started showing pretty quickly that these aren't unowned dogs. These are owned dogs. Mm. And that allowed me to have the discussions with the the powers that be at the city that I got to start doing some people programs here. I can run all kinds of animal programs at the shelter, but we're going to be in the same spot 10 years from now. If we don't start tackling some of the people issues about why are their dogs running loose to begin with? And that was a real eye opener when I showed them a heat map of loose dog bites throughout the city of Dallas. And there was so many more, I think it was 82% of the loose dog bites were of owned dogs in the city of Dallas. Totally debunked the story that it's just a bunch of loose dogs. Feral dogs that are out there. So what did you do in terms of re-educating people? It was tough. And I even have a little different mindset now than at the time. They had these citations that are called fix-it tickets. And so there were mandatory spay-neuter, microchip, and rabies shot. and so. I like the idea of those fix-it tickets because we could do enforcement, but also give the people the opportunity that the, the ticket would get totally dismissed with compliance. Mm. Okay, you don't got to get wrapped up in the legal system. You don't have to pay any fines, but you got three weeks to get this stuff done. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of a carrot and the stick, mm-hmm. you know, methodology. And then there were providers, nonprofit providers in the city of Dallas that would also spay and neuter the animal as part of it. Here you get your micro, you'll get totally, totally in compliance, but you got three weeks to do it or else mm-hmm. you are ticket. You can go talk to a judge. It's the mm-hmm. law. It's got to, it's got to have all those. It's very, very effective because my officers weren't just bad guys. They weren't just the guy who wrote you a ticket, go on your way, go pay it. And hopefully you don't speed anymore. This was, we were giving them an answer on how to get out of the situation as well. Um, and it was really successful. It 
22,500 citations were issued in fiscal year um, 19. Mm -hmm. And of the answer to, there were still citations that just hadn't been answered to yet. It was like 88% of them were dismissed with compliance. So it showed that work was actually, you know, you were getting the result that, hey, the animal got in compliance, the person got the stuff in compliance. Who wants a warrant over not having a microchip in your dog? But it was... Texas, don't rush it for anything around here. So, so your officers went out with their avid chip reader or whatever to, to mm-hmm. look for that and uh, the tag, I'm imagining. Well, that was in place of the tag. Mm-hmm. I, it was a make sense. I've got a whole thing. We could talk for three hours about my thoughts on dog licenses. Yeah. Microchips are forever. Right. Yes. One in a blue moon can malfunction, but tags get ripped off all the time. Right. I gave my dog a bath and I forgot to put the collar back on. Yeah. Yep. And so... You can, um, Dallas, it's as long as you have a microchip, you don't have to call in every year or anything at all. So they weren't looking at any type of revenue from it. They just wanted to be able to identify the animals. Mm-hmm. Quite frankly, my return to owner rate went through the roof in a good way once we started getting microchips into everything. Mm. Dog gets out, it happens, scan it, get the dog back to his owner. He doesn't have to come to the shelter. Let's get them, get them back, give them whatever resources they need to try to keep the dog restrained. And everybody wins. The shelter doesn't get overloaded. Um, And the dog gets back to its owner. And you said that there are organizations in Dallas that would, if finances were an issue, that would be handled. You'd be able to get a chip. Correct. Everything south of Interstate 30 in Dallas, that is the underserved area in the the city of Dallas. Mm -hmm. It's still a huge area. It's Mm -hmm. a bigger landmass than the city of Atlanta and Mm -hmm. some more people than the city of Atlanta, just southern Dallas alone. But um, the SPCA of Texas, as well as Spay Neuter Network, were the providers that foundations in the Dallas area funded or still are funding that project too. Their main goal was to get the animals fixed. But we talked about, look, there they got to get the rabies shot. They got to get their microchip. So they included that. Hey, let's, let's get this all done at one time because you're not always going to be able to get multiple contacts with somebody. So when you have that touch point and you're giving them a service, give them everything you can while you have that contact with them. So other than the carrot and the stick ticketing process, what else proved effective in Dallas? Oh, well, a couple of things. I always wanted my officers to be approachable. It's dangerous. We get guns pulled on us all the time. Mm. Um, just before I left, we had an officer shot at. We had a tire shot out of a vehicle a couple months before that. It's rough out there. Um, and you're enforcing laws, but you're not carrying guns. You've got a snare pole <laughs> and a snappy snare. Um, <laughs> you know, so Put down you, you that gun. I have, I have this snappy yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. So it's a very, very difficult position for them to be in. But little simple things. I love going out in the field with my officer. Loved it, loved it, loved it. And they're always like, they're like, director, why the hell are you always waving at people? <laughs> and I would always just wave at people like you're in a small town. And it's amazing. The areas I would stay in more often – from at the beginning, people were like, who is this dude waving at me? Who eventually they're like, hey, and you're making yourself a part of the community. Mm. And then eventually they're like, hey, are you looking for that brown dog? I saw him down the street. And it's amazing once they trust you and you're not just the enforcer coming in once called. So we did a lot of proactive calls. So it's sort of like community policing. Correct. Yep. And let them know that we're there. And I, and I will say that one of the things that BCG said, our response time was so horrible. And so many calls just never even responded to at all. Like if they call us, we got to go guys and gals. We, they're not going to trust us if we say call us and then we don't come. Be honest about what our time is. Hey, it might be three to five hours, depending on the priority of the call. Right. But it's important we hit these and that we show up. Even if what the call was for is done mm-hmm. or not happening anymore, Leave a notice so they knew we were there. Make sure you turn on your flashy yellow lights just so that they know you came. Yeah. Response is a big deal because if you're in a community that you call and your perception is, I call the city for services and they don't show anyway, why the hell am I going to call? Yeah, it's like calling 911 and they don't show up. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. So they, there was a lot of that of just making yourself approachable and friendly while you're out in the communities. And that wasn't necessarily the aura that had been put out before. It was very much either enforcement or we were just going to stay out of your area. We're going to just stay out altogether. And that's when people started getting bitten badly. Brunette Brown was mauled to death by that pack of dogs. So wow. we weren't going to go that route. And it was highly effective and so effective that uh, you were invited to, to move to North Texas to Operation Kindness. We're going to take a break. But when we come back, I want to learn a little bit more about Operation Kindness. And now, a message from your dog. 
every day with you is like a day at the beach. And I want as many beach days as possible. I want to run and sniff and find a good stick to carry. I want to roll in the grass and warm my belly in the sun. I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want ever pup. The green grassy beef liver spiked smell wakes my senses. You may not realize this, but it tastes like homemade gravy, especially when you wet it. It infuses any food you give me with health and life and vibrancy. I can feel it, Everpup traveling to every cell in my body, nourishing each one. Does it roll back time? Of course not, not really, but it helps me feel like I'm on top of the world. I'm so glad you're giving it to me every day because every day I'm so glad to be with you. I'm so grateful to be your dog and for the ever pup you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. But to get the best price possible, join the Everpup Club at everpupclub.com, where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Everpup every day. We're speaking with Ed Jamison, CEO now of Operation Kindness, which is in North Texas. So you moved from Dallas to North Texas to a totally different type of facility. Tell us about Operation Kindness. Yeah. So Dallas Animal Services is the biggest. It was the third largest intake in the country. But so the largest intake in Texas and a couple of nonprofits that do, you know, really good work, the SPCA of Texas and Operation Kindness was another partner, but they're in just north of the city of Dallas. Mm-hmm. Got along terrifically with their CEO. I'd met him at a best friends conference and he was really working on the partnership. But hey, how, how can we help you more? And allowed me to meet his team. And they were undergoing a um, big construction project. And he was like, yeah, I'm, I'm really just kind of, you know, filling in until construction is done. Didn't think much of it. His name was Bob, is Bob, great guy. And he calls me one day in February, I think it was late in February, and just said, yep, construction is almost done. I'm going to stick to my word and I'm retiring. It's like, oh man. And I, I wouldn't even think anything of it. I thought he, you know, I'm like, here, I'll tell you if I can think of anybody. And he asked me a couple of questions and um, I called him the next day. I was like, Bob, were you, were you thinking about me when you were asking about if there's people you might? And he was like, I was kind of hoping you'd get there, but I didn't want to play <laughs> friend. He's a lot smarter than he looks. He, he, he got me pretty good. But he's like, here, you just should meet my board anyway. You should know my board president and vice president. Even when I'm gone, you should have a relationship with them. And it was very quickly, they wanted to, with this $13 million investment of this beautiful, beautiful facility here in Carrollton, Texas, they wanted to have more impact and they, they wanted me to come to help lead the team here. So the hardest thing was having to leave team DAS. We had been through so much. We had you know, brought in wonderful people from all around the country to work there and, you know, help people that were already there grow. And it's a great, great team, but I wanted to give the nonprofit side a try. I've always done a good job of making government bureaucracy as nimble as it can be. I mean, Dallas is huge. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of red tape and a lot of stuff. I'm like, man, from the nonprofit side, even though it's smaller in numbers, we're never going to bring in 40,000 dogs and cats in a year here like we did at DAS. But I'm like, we could have as much if not more impact by doing the things and becoming the partner to the government shelters that I always wanted nonprofits to be for me. Help me with what I need help with, not what you want to help and fits in with your fundraising plan or whatever. What are the difficult animals that need help? And that's what we're really trying to do at Operation Kindness is with our partners. What do you need help with? And let us try to help you because I know their challenges are tougher than my challenges as far as budgets and bureaucracy. So Operation Kindness is sort of a, a community centric nonprofit, right? Correct. Yep. It, it is a brick and mortar nonprofit um, shelter. We don't have any enforcement. We're not doing any animal cruelty investigations or hoarding or anything. And I'm like, how cool is this for the first time in my life? As much as I like enforcement, I'm the vice president of the National Animal Care and Control Association. But for the first time in 20 years, it's all about saving animals 
and helping people be the best pet owner they can be. That's 100% what my job is. And I'm like, that. that is pretty cool to be able to just be creative, progressive on how can we help more animals, the animals that really need help, and then help the people who have pets. How can we help them? And my board really understands. They're like, Ed, we just spent $13 million on a building. What do you mean you're trying to keep the animal from coming in? And it's a, you know, when you explain, look, they're great people. We have a pet food pantry. And it's like, we don't need to take their animal if a bag of dog food is all they need to help get them over the hump or a resource. And so the board has been great in understanding that we're always going to have animals that need to come in this shelter, but they don't all need to come in. And if we want to be that community resource for whatever you need, if you're looking for a pet, or you need help with keeping your pet. That's what we want Operation Kindness to be. The pet food pantry sounds like such an obvious no-brainer, but oh my God, that's brilliant. It's one of those brilliant no-brainers. Right. Um, and I can't take credit for that. They were already doing that here, but it was only so known. I didn't know it until they told me they were they were doing it. And I'm like, I got all kinds of people in Dallas who need dog food. <laughs> I bet you can find a few pet food companies that would donate as well. So It, it is. And it, it's all done on donations. Yeah. I don't think we've ever had to go out and buy a pallet of dog food for our pantry. We, we let the community know we're getting low. And Amazon and Chewy and all the, mm. the, the big ones. Bissell Foundation just gave us two semi loads worth of supplies for our. <laughs> so it's a good cause. There's tons of stuff. People are just like, yeah, this is extra. No problem. We'll bring it down to you. And we're getting it to the people that need it the most. We've even expanded it into rescues that need some help that, hey, look, you need some extra dog or cat food. Let us know. And we can get that to you also. What are some of the other things that you're able to do as it being a nonprofit versus through a more governmental agency? Well, I can say that the litter of kittens that needed eyelids to be rebuilt, that it was worth $10,000 to send that litter of cats to have their eyelids rebuilt. You just can't do that on a government budget. Even though this is Dog Podcast Network, you're talking about cats. Sorry, yeah, I try to cats. But um, what happened? Eyelid rebuilding of a litter? Was, these cats they actually came from DAS. They had this genetic messed up issue with their eyes mm -hmm. and they didn't have eyelids. So they basically plastic surgery. They took tissue from the lips and rebuilt, but we had to take them out to a specialist. That just can't happen in government world. <laughs> you you can't spend $10,000 on eight kittens. You, you can't. You, you, you can't with taxpayer dollars. Right. But in Operation Kindness, we can. And that, that is our thing. Medical money will never be an issue. A dog or a cat isn't going to be alive That if that animal comes to us. So our partners, contagious diseases we specialize in, nobody volunteers to get parvo dogs. Mm -hmm. We're like partners, except for Austin Pets Alive. And so most shelters in North Texas are driving dogs down to Austin with parvo. And we're like, no, 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 call us. Come 20 minutes up the road. And we've got Parvo wards and um, ringworm, tons of ringworm cats. I know this is the dog cast, but these animal diseases are what we're really trying to specialize because I know most government shelters aren't able to treat those. Is that a function of you having so much more money as a nonprofit? Is that a function of the community? Is that a function of the veterinarians who are more willing to participate on, on a pro bono basis or all of that? A little bit of everything. So when you're dealing with taxpayer dollars, it, it's amazing. You save an animal's life and you'd be amazed at sometimes the hate I would get in government world about how I wasted money. Hmm. Start a heartworm dog program in, um, at Dallas and a bunch of hate mail that it's a waste of money. Um, our mission is to save every savable animal. I mean, that's completely paraphrased, but that is what we do here. Mm -hmm. is if it's savable, then we're going to do everything that can be done to save it. So that just falls into it. That money is not going to be the issue for an animal getting out alive, that if, if it can be treated, some things just can't be treated and you have to make a tough decision. But if it needs a procedure, either we're going to do the procedure ourselves or we'll send it to a specialist to get the procedure done. Well, speaking of specialists, you don't just focus on the medical, you sometimes focus on the behavioral. Correct. And we've really upped, um, upped our game on that. I'll be honest. And the people here will tell you they some of the past history, there was a lot of, let's just try to get as many cute fluffies as we can and right. small dogs. There's not many of those in the government shelters anymore. There's really not. And that's not what they need help with. Everybody knows somebody or 10 people that have a little bitey chihuahua or a little yippy dog. That is, they're not going to cause any damage. Everybody loves a dog. It lives at whatever. But when a 60 pound dog is nippy, may not be mean, but he's yippy. Mm -hmm. that, that's a problem. He's, you know, they've got the ability to, to cause some damage. So I hope that we get ourselves to the point that we're actively going out to bring in known behavior 
but we have animal dogs that when they were sick, they were fine. Then we made them not sick and they started acting like a little Cujo. <laughs> so we have a really good behavior team that we were boosting up. Um, believe it or not, donors really love to support behavior. Mm-hmm. I think most people can rectify a medical euthanasia that this animal needed to be put down because he was suffering that way, where it's a lot harder to rectify a behavioral euthanasia. Mm. So we want to do everything to say that, look, we've tried everything behavior wise so that hopefully we don't have to get to euthanasia decision or a true public safety decision. And we've got a really, really good, um, Shania Johnson is my behaviorist and her team. They're amazing. And we do a lot of aftercare once an animal is adopted here. Just as problems come, you don't know. You know what you know when the animal's in the shelter. He might have got adopted after a day. We didn't know he chewed the couch or <laughs> pees on the carpet. We, we just didn't know he wasn't with us long enough. And so we give a lot of aftercare on behavior so that hopefully the animal doesn't have to get returned. That can give people the resources to, to work through situations. Wow. Well, focusing on an animal's behaviors certainly feels like a long way away from you being animal warden in a suburb of Cleveland. And dealing with that, the evolution or the change of, in perception about animal control is continuing. Where do you see it going? If you had to pull out your crystal ball in five years, where do you see it being? It's it's a really interesting time. Obviously, the last couple of years have been really, really difficult on this country. Forget about politics or anything like that. But there, there's just been a lot and economically and people affected by um, the pandemic. Um, as foreclosures start to happen more. The pets are going to pay a price for that, but all kinds of other stuff that a family is going to pay a price in that too. So I was lucky that I had a seat at the table on the human discussions when I was in Dallas, that I was able to sit with the homeless solution meetings and sit with the utility company meetings and sit with all these other human things. And I could say, remember, they got animals. Remember, they have pets. You didn't meet all the human needs if you didn't meet their pets needs also. I think a lot more places started thinking about that when they were looking about getting through the pandemic and what do people need. Um, Mm -hmm. A lot more discussions about, don't forget, their pets need something too here as we're trying to find an answer for the human. So I would like to think that that's going to, if the economy cannot tank, I think that animal control agencies got a little higher seat at the table to be a part of discussions in their municipality, city, county, whatever they're in that. They're not just the dog catcher. There's human problems. Just like all of the talks with reform police and things like that of two summers ago, um, the same type of deal. Should should the animal control just be catching dogs or should, should they be helping to fix the hole in the fence so the dog never gets out to begin with? And remotely progressive governments say, of course, we want to find a way to patch the fence as opposed to writing them hundreds of dollars worth of tickets and impounding their dog and them getting a warrant and all of that. You know, logical politicians from both sides of the aisle will say, yeah, can you just fix the fence for them? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's where I'm really hoping is that it gets into Fixing those problems that the humans behind the animals have, fixing their issues as well, are going to, the animals benefit from those. And remembering that there's a human behind almost all these animals. Ed Jamison, CEO of Operation Kindness, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, James, so much. I really enjoyed it. Now, as promised, we reached back out to Ed to see what he has been up to since our last chat. Ed and Operation Kindness have been busy throughout the pandemic with over 1,655 adoptions and over, get this, 41,000 pounds of pet food distributed. They've also opened a new 24-hour neonatal kitten nursery. And starting in July, they launched a new community initiatives program that offers affordable, accessible veterinary services and resources to underserved areas. They hope to impact an additional 8,000 pets in the community through this new program. And if you or someone you know is in Texas and you'd like to get dressed up all Texas swanky style to support a fantastic cause, well, get this. Their canines, cats, and cabernet, canines, cats, and cabernet, just rolls off the tongue. It's an auction and gala. It'll be coming up on November 12th, 2022 at the Sheraton Hotel Dallas. It is their largest fundraiser of the year, and they hope to raise a cool $1 million. Finally, Operation Kindness has a robust enrichment program to keep dogs entertained while at the shelter. They do this through recycling household items that they turn into fun activities 
and they take donations. If you'd like to donate to any of these programs, and you can find out more on their website at operationkindness.org, and we will have the link in today's show notes. Well, that is all we have time for today. I want to thank you for joining us on The Long Leash. And if you know of someone who would be a great guest for our show, please get in touch with us. You can do that via our website at longleashshow.com. And also, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to The Long Leash. It is free. It's in your favorite podcast app, or you can catch us on YouTube. If you'd like to find out about the other shows that we do here at Dog Podcast Network, well, then please visit our website. You can find that at dogpodcastnetwork.com. I'm James Jacobson from all of us here at Dog Podcast Network. I'd like to wish you and your dog a very warm Aloha. Aloha.